There are assumptions that have been with us so long in computer graphics that we sometimes forget how strange they really are. So for instance, if I make a fist, you don't expect my fingers to pass through themselves, and you certainly don't expect them to merge together like droplets of water. But that's what happens by default with standard representations, whether explicit or implicit, of surfaces. So the basic question of this talk is, how can we work directly in the space of intersection-free shapes? Now for animation, we can avoid intersections by simulating the dynamical response to collisions, but this doesn't help with broader tasks where we might need to analyze or process or synthesize intersection-free geometry, and don't simply want the shape you get by slamming one object into another. For instance, let's say I have three poses of the human body with a right arm in front, the left arm in front, and the arms behind the back. What would it mean to take an average of these poses? Can you picture that in your head? I suspect you don't picture something like this with unnatural bending and self-intersections, but that's what we get if we just take a simple average of vertex coordinates. What we probably want instead is a physically realizable middle pose, like this one, maybe with the arms down near the waist. And this is not something I can get by just slamming my arms into my chest and then simulating a collision response, right? I need a more global perspective on the problem. And that's what I want to develop today, a so-called shape space where each point corresponds to a configuration of the shape and such that shapes with intersections are infinitely far away from those without intersections. So this way, all basic operations like averaging or interpolation or extrapolation become intersection-free by construction. Our approach is going to be to start with some existing shape space, for instance, based on an elastic energy, and pick a repulsive potential that penalizes points in close proximity. Graphing this potential then gives a new shape space, which we call the graph manifold, where it takes uh, infinite time to reach an intersecting configuration. We then discretize our energies in space, introducing in particular a new adaptive tangent point energy, which ensures there are no intersections, and unlike past collision potentials, converges to a meaningful smooth limit under refinement. We finally discretize in time and then solve space-time optimization problems to get our final intersection-free poses and trajectories. So let's take a look at this in a little more detail. We begin with a space M of so-called viscous shells, where again, each point is a shape configuration, encoded by vertex positions of a mesh. If we think of the surface as an elastic body, then we're gonna define the cost of a small deformation as the heat lost to the internal fr friction. Uh, more explicitly, this means the Riemannian metric G is the Hessian of some elastic potential W. We'll use a discrete elastic shell model, but in principle, nothing prevents you from using, say, a volumetric model instead. To interpolate between two shapes, we can now minimize the path energy, which is basically the total heat lost to internal friction over the course of a motion. But of course, a purely elastic model is gonna do nothing to prevent self-intersections. So what can we do about this? Well, one natural idea is to consider a repulsive potential, something that discourages intersections. And for now, we'll just say that a potential phi is repulsive if it's finite for non-intersecting states and approaches infinity as we get closer and closer to intersections. A tempting idea then is to take our original path energy and simply add the total potential over time. Unfortunately, this is a bad idea because the geometry now wants to explode away from itself. Here, for instance, not only do the arms fly away from the body, but the surface sort of inflates to reduce the repulsive potential. So, we take a different path. Starting with our initial shape space M, we graph the potential phi, meaning that we define a new manifold M phi, where each point is a pair X phi of X for all X in the original shape space M. If we now pull back the ambient metric to the original shape space M, we get a new Riemannian metric, G phi, which is equal to the original metric, plus a term that measures the change in the repulsive potential. Now, why is this a good idea? Well, for one thing, it prevents intersections. In particular, we can show that the resulting geodesic distance to any intersecting state is infinite. At the same time, we don't penalize motions that maintain roughly a constant degree of self-proximity. For instance, if my hands are close to my body at the beginning and at the end, why should I be concerned if they remain about as close throughout an entire motion? That seems fine. To make an analogy, the naive scheme was like going from one mountain peak to another by going all the way back down to the parking lot and then hiking back uphill. Right? This doesn't make sense. The graph manifold says, no, that's stupid. Just, just find a nice flat ridge trail to travel along. I should also be clear that this is not the same as how collision potentials are used in simulation. 
So there, the potential gradient turns into a force that actually changes the direction of motion. If I drop a basketball on the ground, it bounces back up off the floor. Here, we literally stretch out space itself so that it takes infinite time for the basketball to reach the floor. In this animation, the, the ball is just falling and falling and falling forever. Kind of like if you saw a rocket ship approaching a black hole, it would take forever to reach the event horizon. An important piece of the story is, therefore, the choice of repulsive potential itself. And so a good question is, what makes a good repulsive energy for shape spaces? Well, basically, under refinement, it must be strong enough to prevent collision and weak enough to remain finite. Um, for instance, if we use a simple Coulomb potential, just the, uh, the integral of the inverse distance over all point pairs, this is always going to be infinite, even for surfaces that do not have self-intersection. On the flip side, the IPC potential, which uses a logarithmic singularity, turns out to be too weak to be repulsive in the continuous setting. For instance, you can construct even simple examples where the continuous energy remains finite as you approach self-intersection. So we instead use the so-called tangent point energy, which for each point pair penalizes the curvature of the smallest sphere passing through y and tangent at x. And this energy has exactly the properties we need. Infinite for self-intersecting geometry, finite for intersection-free geometry. One way to approximate it is to sum the anagrand over all pairs of triangle centers, which can be accelerated from order n squared down to order n log n using a fast multipole method. However, there's a problem, which is since we treat each triangle as a point, the energy can still be finite even when two surfaces intersect. So in this paper, we introduce a new adaptive version of tangent point energy, which in brief, uh, continues the multipole scheme down below the level of individual triangles. We basically develop a, a very carefully crafted multipole acceptance criterion. Practically, what happens is if we, we check if each triangle pair violates a multipole condition, if so, we split both triangles into four and repeat. And so this way, we still get an infinite energy barrier, even for coarsely meshed uh, regions, but the increase in cost is negligible since we only have to do this for a small number of triangles. In fact, there's a, sort of a common misconception that tangent point energy must be slow because it sort of naively considers all pairs of elements. But the reality is, um, this is ridiculous. It can actually be a lot faster even than the IPC potential as long as you use a multipole method, right? Just like you would, you know, you would always use a bounding volume hierarchy to do ray tracing. So let's take a look at some examples. The key idea is we're going to translate basic operations on our, our shape data into standard objects on a Ramanian manifold. For instance, interpolation means computing a geodesic with a given endpoints. Extrapolation means tracing out a curve from a starting configuration and velocity using the exponential map. Averaging could be some kind of geometric uh, average like the Karcher mean. Uh, deformation transfer corresponds to parallel transport and so on. Numerically, all of these operations basically build on minimization of a discrete path energy, which sums the geodesic distance between consecutive configurations. Um, that distance is in turn approximated by the discrete elastic energy, plus the difference in adaptive tangent point energy. In the examples we're about to see, the overall cost is very similar to physics-based simulation, about 15 minutes end to end. So here's your first uh, sort of challenging interpolation example. I have two poses of the hand with fingers interleaved in different ways. And here, we get this motion without any kind of skeleton or rig, just the meshes. And what's really beautiful and amazing about this example is that this complicated intersection-free motion is literally just a straight path in our shape space. If we compare to volumetric model, uh, methods for rigid, non-rigid surface registration, we find that Lagrangian uh, mesh-based approach that, that we use really helps in these regions of tight contact, whereas an Eulerian grid uh, has trouble resolving the opposing motion of the interlocking fingers. We can also do non-rigid path planning by, inter by performing interpolation in the presence of static repulsive obstacles. For instance, sending this large ball through a small hole. And what's really cool here is the shape actually deforms in anticipation of obstacles. So again, this isn't like dynamical simulation. We're not just slamming on the brakes at the motion of impact. Um, here we also see the effect of varying the membrane stiffness. Repulsive interpolation can also help with a frustrating task that we all experience of turning your laundry right side out. So basically reversing all the dihedral angles of your mesh. And here we get very naturally look, natural looking wrinkles while avoiding self-contact. Beyond interpolation, we can also extrapolate a small initial deformation. For instance, if we just bend the tip of a leaf ever so slightly in our modeler, we can then say, please extrapolate that motion and it'll curl up nicely while avoiding uh, intersection. So notice that in this example, a straight path actually gradually increases the repulsive potential, but in a way that's guided by the initial deformation. 
Once we have these basic primitives, we can start building up higher order operations like statistics on our shapes. So here, if I can, I can compute the uh, weighted average with an elastic uh, model, but of course we get lots of intersections. If I add this repulsive term, we get this nice sort of intersection-free space that I could imagine pre-computing uh, or, or baking for future use. Finally, the combination of elastic and tangent point energy is useful outside the shape space context. Here we use it to find near isometric embeddings of abstract surfaces like the hyperbolic plane and the flat torus. And we can also do some sort of uh, nonlinear packing. So uh, here our repulsion based uh, technique gives us something quite different from what you would get with a collision model, which again is sort of in strict contact. Finally, we can start to address some challenges that have been with us since ancient times, such as this uh, proverb from Matthew, which says, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so um, by, by using our method, we can make this easier for our well-to-do friends. Okay. So here we pack him down into this intersection-free toothpick. All right, great. All right. All right. So, uh, before I end, uh, I really need to say, although I'm here presenting this work, my co-authors, Joshua Sassen, Henrik Schumacher, and Martin Rumpf, really deserve a huge amount of the credit here, and I really hope that you will associate their names and faces with this uh, work moving forward. So, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Gina.